This presentation describes the evolution of engineering education in South Africa, the impact of an unprecedented edu educational transition caused by recent change in national policy and the education standards developed by, um, by EXA. So <clears throat> it's really important for us to, to start with, with, with some history. If we don't know where we come from, we won't know where we go. Uh, go to. So it was only in 1968, coincidentally, the, the, the year that I was born. Um, so that's exactly about 55 years ago that the Professional Engineering Act governing the professional registration of engineers was promulgated in South Africa. Uh, the formal recognition of other members of the engineering team associated and associate qualifications, in particular uh, technicians and technologists, began only after recommendations of the Committee of Inquiry into the training, use and status of engineering technicians in the Republic of South Africa, commonly known as the Good Report after the chairman of the com committee, Mr. R. R. C. J. Good, and that was only published in 1978, so 10 years after the, the original act was promulgated. <clears throat> Now, the Good Report is, a, is really a very, very important report. Um, it's a watershed report, and we would not have this meeting today, and even iPad, iPad would not exist if it was not for this report. So this report, the Good Report, resulted in at least four watershed changes to technical training in South Africa. Um, number one was the expansion of the engineering team to include engineering technologists, such that a complete engineering team comprises artisans, uh, engineering technicians, engineering technologists, and professional engineers. Uh, number two, it led to the introduction of a formal qualification for technologists to provide the training needed for this new engineering category. So this is where it all started. The amendment, the amendment of Act 81 of 1968 um, uh, was also uh, put forward to create the registered technician and professional technologist registration categories. Uh, the, the, the fourth and last recommendation that came out of the good report was the endorsement of a sandwich approach to training, where 50% of the training took place in industry in the work in the form of work integrated learning, resulting in workplace based learning that became the hallmark of the um, then uh, Colleges for Advanced Technical Education, which became Technicons and eventually UOTs. So there's a lot that we can um, thank the Good Report um, for. International recognition was only attained uh, later in 1999 when the Engineering Council of South Africa became a co-signatory to the Washington Accord for Engineers and later a, a founding co-signatory to the Sydney, Sydney and Dublin Accords. These initiatives eased the mobility of engineering practitioners and the recognition of qualifications in co-signatory countries. Um, it's also prudent now to speak about the HEQSF, although the adoption of the recommendations of the Good Report created a stable environment for the training of the engineering team in the Southern African environment. In December 2012, the Minister of Higher Education and Training approved a revised Higher Education Qualifications sub-framework published in the Government, Government Gazette number 36003, um, which created a disruptive influence on the qualifications offered by universities of technology, international comparability, and industry expectations. Um, one of the disruptions was the uh, ch change to uh, the Bachelor of Technology and changing that into an advanced diploma and, and so on. So let's just quickly look at uh, the historical qualifications, engineering, faculties at UOTs were allowed to offer, and the new qualification types faculties at UOTs may offer under the new HEQSF. It's also important to, to note that the historical qualifications uh, links link to the SACWA Act, the old SACWA Act, um, which only had eight levels uh, at 
level five, it was the national certificate. At level six, it was the national diploma. At level seven, um, was the Bachelor of Technology, which was at the same level as the Bachelor of Engineering at traditional universities. And then at level eight, and eight was um, the, were the Master of Technology and the Doctor of Technology. Under the new NQF Act that, that were promulgated, you will see that there are now 10 levels and um, the national certificate um, was replaced by the higher certificate, the advanced certif certificate um, and the diploma at level six, five and six. Um, at level seven, we have the advanced diploma or the Bachelor of Engineering Technology. Both of these qualifications are at level, si level seven. At level eight, we have uh, the Bachelor of Engineering, and yes, UOTs with a good motivation are now allowed to also offer the Bachelor of Engineering if they really want to, the Postgraduate Diploma in Engineering, and the Bachelor of Engineering Technology Honours. All of these are at level eight. And then at level nine, we have the Master of Engineering, and then at level 10, uh, the PhD or the Doctor of Engineering. So we've now <coughs> Um, refer to the new NQF or the NQF, the na national qualifications um, framework has 10 levels and it's really important to, to note that each of, um, there are three sub frameworks with, within the, the NQF. Uh, we have the general and further education and training qualifications sub framework the GFETQSF, which uh, is developed and managed by Uma Lucy, the Higher edu Education Qualification Sub-Framework, um, which is developed and managed by the Council on Higher Education. But we also have, very importantly, the Trades and Occupations Qualification Sub-Framework, commonly known as Occupational Qualification Sub-Framework, the OQS OQSF, um, and that is developed and man managed by the Quality Council for Trades and Occupations, um, the QCTO. So if we look at a graphical representation of this, then you will see that here in the middle, we have our 10, uh, 10 levels. Uh, the OQSF actually spans all these levels um, up to level 10, although uh, the development of qualifications um, at levels 7 to 10 are still um, pending. The GFTEQSF um, spans levels 1 to 4 with some discussions around level 5. And then the HCQSF um, spans levels 5 to 10. But I think it's also important to note that I do foresee that in the near future, um, EXO will also have to look at the OQSF and since it spans levels 1 to 10, there might also be different standards that allow for graduates at those levels to um, register in the different categories. If we look at the HQSF menu, then we, we see that uh, we, we have a variety of different qualification types. Um, from levels five to 10, starting with the higher certificate and advanced certificate at level six, a diploma um, at level six, a diploma uh, um, with workplace based credits, also at level six, an advanced diploma at level seven, a bachelor at, at level um, seven, a professional bachelor at, at level eight, a bachelor honors at level eight, a postgraduate diploma at level eight, a master's at level nine and the doctoral degree at level 10. So let's just quickly then look at the standards that were developed to, to match the HQSF. Um, there is a higher certificate in engineering at level five that has 140 credits with at least 120 credits at level five, specifically aimed at engineering support occupations. At level six, Three standards were developed, an advanced certificate, a diploma in engineering technology, and a diploma in engineering, uh, all at level six, but there are uh, nuances between the diploma and the, in engineering and the diploma in engineering technology. I've made these crosses here because 
even though the standards have been developed, uh, there has been pushback from the DHET and the CHE, the CHE and, and some universities who, who faced in the two-year um, diploma in engineering technology had to convert that into a three-year um, or a 360 diploma. Um, so um, implementing those, although the standards are there, um, um, actually became not relevant anymore. We have the advanced diploma in engineering. We have the bachelor of engineering technology. Both of these are at level seven and they lead to a candidate technologist. Um, those at level six lead to a candidate technician. And then at level eight, we have three qualifications, three standards that, that were developed, the Bachelor of Engineering, um, typically four years with 560 credits, the Bachelor of Engineering Technology Honors with 140 credits, at least 120 credits at level eight. Uh, also developed is the postgraduate diploma um, at level eight with at least um, 120 credits credits at level at level eight, although the qualification is 140 credits, and the Master of Engineering standard um, with 100, 180 credits at level nine, with at least 120 credits um, at level nine. And the question that you might want to ask is, why are there honors, postgraduate diploma, and Master of Engineering standards developed? if UOTs only are allowed to uh, register candidate engine, um, technologists. The, the answer is that, in fact, um, in the spirit of the HCQSF, universities of technology or traditional universities, if they want, have the opportunity to present a, a, a package of qualifications together for, um, for accreditation. So the, the Master of Engineering mentioned here is in fact a professional master's degree and if a university of technology then wants to present the BNG Tech, for example the BNG Tech honors and the master of engineering um, professional as uh, a package of qualifications to the education committee then 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 someone with an MNG can also now register in principle as a candidate engineer although we are waited for by, with bated breath for um, a University of Technology to, to actually use this opportunity and take the lead and make that happen. So graphically, uh, what you can see is that we, we have a number of qualifications that, um, that standards that, that lead to um, registration as a candidate technician. I've talked about the, 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 the 280 diploma, which, which is being phased out, um, and the emphasis that is being placed on the diploma, um, a 360 diploma here. We also have the BN Tech, and so the diploma will, will lead to candidate technician, but you can add an advanced diploma that will lead to registration as a candidate technologist, or the BNG Tech will also re lead to registration as a candidate technologist. We, we also have the Bachelor of Engineering standard that leads to the candidate engineer, meeting the educational requirements to register as a candidate engineer. And then the, the, the three newest standards developed are the BNG Tech Honors standard, the postgraduate diploma um, standard, they are at the same level and more or less have the same uh, outcomes and then obviously the Master of Engineering, uh, which is a professional education that can also lead to registration as a candidate engineer. So there are now two arrows pointing to this, this block here. And in principle, although it still has to be tested by, by institution, um, they, they, they could now be seamless mobility from any level, any category of registration to any other category. This is the HUQSF in a flowchart which engineers are all capable of reading. But if you look at it, it's more confusing than anybody has ever existed. If I presented this to an HR practitioner and I said, these are the qualifications that you can employ people from. And yes, OK, it shows you the level five uh, HQF levels, level six, level seven, level eight, level nine and higher. 
all very nice. And it shows you where you can go to to become a technician, a candidate technician, candidate technologist, and candidate engineer. And there are arrows going all over the show, showing you that there are various ways to get there. And that was the benefit of the HUQSF. It was designed to create articulation, meaning somebody who perhaps doesn't meet the requirements to study a BEng Tech could then go and start on the right hand side of the diagram and work their way through one qualification. And then they from there they could go into another one and on and on and on and on and on. And Bladen's and Mundy's words were you could start off as an artisan and one day you could have a PhD. That was the concept of the HEQSF. And I emphasize a concept because when you try and make it work in reality, there is a very, very, very different story. A, there is still some compartmentalization between the UOTs and the universities of science. This qualification clearly shows you that a 420 credit uh, BET degree should be able to be articulated across, if you see the P1.3 route, into the BEng degree, which is good for industry because if you've got a talented youngster who may be based on their poor schooling or secondary education background, did not meet uh, the high and mighty entrance requirements for University A, which is A's for maths and science, or B's minimally, uh, but they excelled on the BEng Tech. It's a much cheaper option to take that candidate and go and pour them into the BEng and allow them to progress through and do the remaining credit. But there are rules to the game. There is a national requirement by the higher uh, de uh, Department of Higher Education where you may only transfer 50% of a qualification from one completed qualification across to another. And like I said earlier, I don't know too many employers in the profession, certainly in the profession in which I am in, which is a civil profession, that fully understand the magnitude of this new thing or animal that has been foisted upon them. And lo and behold, look at the hand. It's again showing you nothing has changed in the science universities. The science universities still offer a BSc Eng or a B Eng. Yes, they've now got a credit allocation to it, and I'll talk a bit more about those in a moment. And from there, you can progress on to a master's degree. Between the two top professional status blobs is that M Eng, the E22P, 180 credit qualification. And if you have a look at this diagram, and if you follow the arrows, if you look at a flow chart, you can get to that M Eng via, via various roots that is the professional masters uh, and nowhere on this diagram does it show how somebody with the old nated 151 qualifications articulates into these programs uh, and what the conditions are and i will come back to that in a moment so it's not well defined many universities don't advertise how they deal with students that are either at an incomplete stage in the old nated qualification or got caught up by the phase out. No new registrations post December 2019 on a native 151 qualification. And we all know we've all ourselves been students. We may go there thinking it's going to take us three years or four years to do our qualification, but life gets exciting when you're a student. There are other things, uh, uh, distractions like the local pub or golf or all the other things, or the ladies or the men, depending on your gender, et cetera, et cetera, or both, if that's your preference. And you end up taking a lot longer to complete your qualification that you had envisaged. Universities have phase out programs, and eventually that tsunami catches up with you, and you sit with a native 151 incomplete qualification, and the universities had to come up with strategies as to how to assist those students to still get to an output where they could graduate and where they could meet the minimum requirements to register in a category. Sometimes universities use a system called conferment of status. So if I've got an old national diploma, can I do the advanced diploma in order to become a technologist? The answer is yes, but you can't simply rock up and say, I want to do the advanced diploma. The university either has to have recorded in its rules that that's an alternative entrance requirement as opposed to the 360 diploma, or you have to go through what they call the conferment of status route. The same applies uh, for somebody who perhaps did the old BTEC and now is looking at going to a master's degree, professional or otherwise, could be also the normal MN research qualification. 
how do they go there? Can they go straight there or must they go via postgraduate diploma in engineering or can they go through a BEng tech? And one of the com concerns uh, Blade and Zamundi himself listed is this academic drift. Must everybody become a BEng graduate or a BE BET graduate or even a diploma graduate? What about the people who are more hands on and should form part of the professional team and perhaps become artisans? It's much easier for somebody to go and if they're a dropout at a university, a science university, they sometimes make the best students in the BEng Tech and or the old national or similar qualifications. Uh, it's not that easy to tell a UOT student, look, you're not cutting the grade in BEng Tech or diploma. Why don't you go and do an N4 or an N6 or an N qualification? It's seen as being a derogatory reference, but there's this concept of academic drift. Every Technicon used to offer a national diploma and most of BTEC with the exception of one or two. Now there are very few universities of technology that are offering the diplomas, uh, either the uh, 280 credit one, which has its own challenges, or the diploma in engineering, which is the 360 credit one. There's been a great deal of academic drift towards producing BNG techs. Is that what the profession wants? You're always going to need the technician. I've heard a dean to say, well, don't worry about it. We're just creating a super technician uh, because we are making them do three years, six years of uh, study. There is no will component or can have a will component. The only qualification in this tire structure that you see that is will is this engineering practice qualification, which again would appear to be going to be phased out and no longer recognized. And the minimum requirement of 30 credits in the diploma in engineering qualification that 30 credit is not calculated on the basis of 10 notional hours per credit for will. It's something different and that causes confusion, but the emphasis on integrating study with work has definitely been overlooked in the way that these new qualifications are being offered. Um, I, I see our, our built environment as an ecosystem that cannot function, any, any particular part of it can't function on its own and it includes government, um, our social partners, the different employer bodies uh, looking after our industry, such as SAFSEC and the MBSA, et cetera, a number of voluntary organizations, SIC and, and uh, their whole host of those, the commercial enterprises of which I lead one, and then the statutory bodies such as the CIDB, um, and, and there are a host, host of those, and, and each one of these parties need to play their game, and it's arguable whether, whether we are getting bang for the buck from all of them. Um, I consider us constructors because we're in a partnership, whether we are consulting engineers, whether we are contractors, or whether we're the client delivery team, we deliver the service to South Africa incorporated. But fragmentation is endemic. Um, we should be more collaborative, and there's a pressing need for delivery. I listened to Imta Sulaiman from Gift of the Givers this morning in a very passionate talk, and, and he said, you know, it's amazing how we can get things done if there's a crisis. Everybody moves aside for the fire truck coming past. But we in the built environment are terrible at planning because there's never a fire and never a crisis. Well, um, from a South African developmental point of view, I think we should acknowledge that there is a crisis and um, joblessness, lack of infrastructure, et cetera, should be treated with the same type of fervency and passion as, as any other crisis that we have. I think it's a bigger crisis than COVID. Significant problems in the industry at the moment, and our industry is not in a good state. These, these are some of the ills we suffer from, low productivity, poor predictability, structural fragmentation, leadership fragmentation, terrible margins, adversarial pricing modules, and financial fragility. We have inappropriate training, funding, and delivery models. Our workforce size and demographics is an issue lack of collaboration and an improvement culture, lack of research and development, and we have a poor industry image. So um, this list, I think, resonates with all of us in construction, but let me then just remind you that this was a list from what it looked like in the UK 15 to 20 years ago. And, and they then went through a lot of trouble to try and rectify this and, and correct the industry. But this is exactly where we are sitting now, and it all boils down to a lack of proper delivery at, at, at the level of the end user being South Africa Incorporated. So, so I consider us all as being partners in delivery. We, we do all of this at, uh, together, being government, academia, 
many of you are in that environment, built environment practitioners, construction service providers, social partners, community organizations, and then all of our suppliers. And we have a collective responsibility towards South Africa. Um, government is the initiator of a lot of these things and, and has got a certain responsibility, but it's coming more and more to be the responsibility of civil society as well as we realize government cannot be expected to do everything. Um, in short, we owe South Africa a better deal than we're doing today. A better deal, in my view, is, is timeliest delivery of, of our projects. We should be providing the right services at the right time. It needs to be cost effective, productive, it has to be good quality, and we need to create a huge amount of jobs in our economy. With this type of injection, um, it will have a meaningful impact on, on where we go long term in South Africa. So, so this is what we want. First of all, math mathematical aptitude is, is extremely important. Um, when students apply to us for a bursary, and, and I did so in, in many of the previous companies I work for, we give them a quick math test, see if they can use Pythagoras' theorem, see if they understand what uh, uh, different formulas are all about and whether they can actually implement the formula. It's sort of at, I would say, at, at grade 11, grade 12 standard. And, and we have a huge amount of students that don't pass that. They simply can't get past that point. And unfortunately, we don't continue any interviews past that. We need practical field survey and setting out. It's very important for us. And in future, it's going to be more towards telematics, drones, survey, and GPS. But it's already necessary for the guys to be able to do that for us. We find that in many cases, we need to do a survey boot camp of about three weeks when, when students um, start their employment and then they, they need to learn how to survey. Construction scheduling and planning is important for us. Planning, organizing, and control of activities um, in the built environment. Then temporary works design is often overlooked, and many of the the uh, technical degrees that, that come out, we expect them to do limited structural analysis, but at least be able to calculate loading on support work, on shuttering and access scaffolding, and then to design it. Um, they need to design basic services and utilities. What does a site layout look like? How do I create a water point for a water truck? What pipe parts do I need to buy? What does a pump work like, et cetera? They need to understand positive suction pressure and things like that. Excavations and associate support planning is important. You know, when you have an excavation collapse, everybody blames the contractor and the workers. It's not the worker's fault. The worker is killed. It's the engineer on site that needs to design, decide whether an excavation is safe or not. So that, that to me, is very important. Um, and it falls under temporary works design. Plant selection, utilization, management, maintenance, uh, quality the quantity calculations and then creating certificates. A very important point is occupational health and safety management with the legal obligations associated. And these are significant in our law. Um, and, and you will be prosecuted for getting it wrong. And, and by rights, you should be if, if you are negligent in this. And we find that many of our students come with no apprehension and, and, and understanding of the responsibility that they have for impacting safety on site. Quality assurance and quality management processes and programs, they need to be able to understand. Human resources management and industrial relationships is, is important. They need a basic understanding, and we obviously have to train in practice for that as well. Um, because, uh, materials that we use, they, they need to be very proficient in understanding the materials and the attributes of that materials. Um, these days, we cannot simply just trust the SABS a grading or certification. We expect um, our, our staff to actually go and check whether the pipe is, is, is actually correct and, and how much filler was put in the PVC and whether that pipe will work. So they need to understand the composition of those materials and how it should be used in the construction process. And it includes things like crushed aggregates, concrete, soils, road materials, etc. And then lastly, drafting and the ability to draw and, and read drawings and understand them is, is a big deficiency we're experiencing from our students um, out there in the field. They need to interpret this to many other people and, and they in the front line in that regard. So those are the skills. I've, I've listed some attributes as well. Um, we, need, we need a candidate that's not easily flustered, able to adapt and make a plan with high energy levels and not easily discouraged. So we don't need the, the scared and timid individual. We need some good work ethics, punctuality, attention to detail, um, um, not sitting on your phone the whole time. Um, somebody that's prepared to work in different locations and not be at home all the time, not afraid to get your hands dirty and earn the respect of the work gang. Really enjoy being outside. 
um, able to communicate in at least two languages, show some mechanical aptitude. I don't need a phone call from, from a youngster in the field says the poker is broken. And I say, well, what's broken on it? And he says, no, the thing doesn't want to work. I'm expecting you to tell me, is it the hydraulic drive unit? Is it the poker head or is it the, what, what is wrong? Um, we need people that are imaginative and creative and don't just stop if there's a problem in front of them and then a strong bias towards action and decision making. And, and certainly the individuals that have these attributes are very successful in the construction field and then go on to, to start their own companies. Um, later on in your career, um, we need people that are able to do risk identification and management, tendering and estimating, that understand construction law, communications and negotiations is something that's part of my and my construction colleagues' daily lives, financial and commercial aptitude, be able to do project management, including design management, because collaborative contracting and, and the, des the management of design teams in the future is going to have to become part of the responsibility of contractors as we start doing full wrap solutions to our clients. Um, to be able to mentor and guide um, other young engineers and employees, and then lastly, to contribute and to impact the social, democratic and political narrative. Um, this is an odd one right at the end, but, but I've realized that if our site um, leaders are not able to do this, they cannot get that, product, that project going. And invariably, when a construction project starts, that is the point where the local community then notices something's going on, and they want to know whether the politicians' promises are going to be kept. And, and we need people that can impact and influence and, and speak to those local communities. It's, it's a skill that... that uh, I didn't think was, was going to be necessary, but certainly it is in what we so, do. So just a few comments on, on the new qualifications. The first thing is that if you had to ask me, can I exactly explain what the new qualification is all about and more importantly, why? I would say no, because I've got a very low understanding thereof. And more importantly, the true motives behind some of these changes, I really don't understand. I don't understand what the, what the impact thereof is supposed to be in the products we generate. Um, the drive to register with EXA, in, in my view at the moment, is quite confused by the potential registration for SACPC and P4R staff as well. So we are finding um, when we pressure our youngsters to say you need to go and register and you need to have a professional um, qualification in totality, many of them say, well, my, my quickest and easiest route is through SACPC and P and EXA has forgotten. I've always had this problem that, that um, technicians and technologists um, didn't have a top of mind to register when they work in the construction environment. But it's important for us because a registered person, you, you may argue that you need a registered person to be able to take the safety leadership on site just for one. Um, so I've always been in favor of this, but but we sit halfway between EXA and SACPCMP um, registration, and, and, and it, it's quite difficult to get our guys registered from their own motivational point of view. Um, and then... It's not simple to be registered at this point in time. I, I must say, um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite jaundiced about it at the moment. Uh, so the, the, the one-year practical training was very valuable, and, and we are sorely missing it at the moment. Um, graduates need a lot of in-the-field training after graduation. I mentioned that. Um, at the moment, supply outstrips demand, um, but we still battle to find the quality candidates. Graduate, graduate expectations of the actual job initially is frequently mismatched um, and, and it is a huge problem for us. From my point of view, faculty members need to connect with the construction industry much more to be able to impact students better and to also, um, let me say, calibrate their expectations to some extent and create a realistic world in which they're going to be entering employment. Um, yet the, day, the last time I saw a lecturer saying, you know, can I bring some students to site or can we, can we give them some side exposure or at least give me the exposure? I prefer actually to, to give faculty members exposure to what we do because that is then taken forward into class um, because those faculty members have this, 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 this quite important role to play in the lives of young people. Um, I, I've added an item at the bottom here that says, does EXA really understand our industry and our needs, including the legal liability we have to have? I, I sometimes get the sense that that board members at, at many of these regulatory bodies are not from the industry and do not really understand what we need and how we can how their decisions can impact service delivery the most. Um, the impacts that we find is that, that employment is difficult if you don't have experience. From an industry point of view, there's a high turnover of, of technical university graduates. I'm not sure why. 
It may just be the type of business we have. Um, the quality of the graduate, your product is questioned. And, and yeah, I have to be honest to say that um, when we have a list of applications and we have to sift um, a application list of 200 applications for, for, for young engineers out, we, our first cut is to look at where they studied. And it's totally wrong. It's, it's, it's not right to do it this way. But we, we see that the products between the different technical universities um, vary greatly. And again, apologies for using the term product. Um, so we're starting to select very carefully and we don't simply trust the qualification. We want to see what the student can do. And that was also a very important aspect of the practical because it actually came to the fore there. Um, so this perception that numbers matter more than quality may be unfair, but it's a reality. Um, and, and I do have a question. Aren't we directing students into the wrong career? Shouldn't many of these youngsters actually become top class artisans? To be very honest, as a top class artisan, you're going to make much more money in your career than you will as an engineer. So, so let us just be very careful how we advise those youngsters. And, and please remember that the, the, the family sitting at home, setting aside a significant portion of their earnings to put our, our, our progeny through a, a, a course that they believe is going to provide them with a better future. And the huge sacrifice being made in this regard. We have an obligation to make sure that those people's funds aren't wasted and we don't have a student after five or six years sitting, not being able to be employed and also not having a career that's going to be fulfilling and profitable to them. So, so there's definitely a question on, on how we should handle this. I'm a fervent, a fervent supporter of, of technical training and vocational training, and it is something we, we have to have a conversation about in South Africa. The near horizon type of roles that I see for for your, your graduates coming into industry, um, it shouldn't be a competition with a four-year engineering BSc degrees. The roles should be identified and defined and well understood who does what. Um, the the technical university graduate should be based in the field as far as construction is concerned. Do basic design with associated drawing communication to the team out there. Um, bring technology onto site and bring the bring that bridge of technology between the design office or the the production control office and the actual work site where the foreman sit. Um, they need to be able to make significant contributions to improve production and productivity, um, and they link and communicate the construction process and the infrastructure impacts to communities as participants and beneficiaries of such a program. So that is already necessary, and we're seeing that pop up. And, and the question would be, are we equipping those, um, those people to be able to do this? In the future, I think the, the, the products coming from technical universities would be those people doing detailed drafting and three-dimensional modeling of, of construction or of, of designs to the point of, of creating populated BIM models with the databases associated with it. The development population of five-dimensional construction and execution models. So those are the three dimensions of the drawing, plus a time element, plus a cost element associated with it. Um, drone survey operators and manipulators of large volumes of data, as far as drone surveys is concerned, um, those people will probably have to come with a qualification that 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 is currently being produced by your institutions. Gamification and simulation of construction, uh, complex construction processes for exercise and safety reasons um, becomes important. And, and you need somebody with a technical background to be able to do that, not just the IT background. Um, On-site supervision is, is still e extremely important. And you, you, know, you can't email a gearbox of a D7 bulldozer to Ethiopia, but you still need a person there and you need a person that's able to email and communicate to actually get that gearbox there. So, so there's a technology link between the site and the design or the project's mainframe. Um, and that's got an associated high level of recording and reporting associated with it. And, and I see those individuals on site having a high aptitude to be able to, to do this crossover and to do this link, which, which currently is, is, is missing on those sites. Um, and then maybe this is a bit blue sky, but operating or programming robotics for very complex and expensive machinery or to operate that machinery. Um, why does one need a, a three-year technical diploma for it? Well, if, if, you, if you were in Germany and you went to a, a technical university there, you might find yourself in that position. 
um, fancy piling rigs and, and marine construction equipment need highly skilled people to understand what the machine is telling them and, and how that impacts the design. I've got a few what I call challenge questions to you. So first of all, this illusion that a future lies in tertiary or non-vocational training only persists. I don't agree with it. There is a very strong future in, non -voca uh, in vocational training as well. I'm challenging you by saying we do not attract students and advise them pers to persist where they may be far better suited to a pure vocational program. And this is the, the, the comment I made to say that, that are we driven by numbers and motivated by this perception driven by a funding model in tertiary education? Is that true? I don't know. Then what's the value proposition we market to the students and their parents who offer everything up for their children's education? Can we be sure with our hands and our hearts that, that we are providing the value they need? Will study funding barriers lower? Should we not focus much better on pre-selection and selecting the candidate suited to the career and be in the correct lane for a rewarding career? We, we have virtually no career guidance happening at schools. Who is going to do this? And is the pre-application process, which is a year in advance of a student joining you, is that process not well suited for this? Um, the, the unintended consequence of sacrificing practical training is a problem. Only that debate cannot stop. We, th we really think that this is very important for us to, to have this, this uh, experiential training, and a total of 12 months is definitely re required. Um, can we afford duplication in qualifications offered by engineering and the construction management departments, respectively? In South Africa, we have different departments at our academic institutions. So you either study in the, the Faculty of Construction Management and Quantity Surveying, or you do so in the engineering faculty. Is a merge not warranted, um, particularly when somebody decides that they want to go into a construction management specialization with an engineering background? Um, this is a question, and I don't know what the answer there is. And then lastly, should we not put a dedicated focus on the municipal engineering and the particular skill set required? You know, how are you going to absorb this three year Bachelor of Engineering Technology degree graduates? Um, because I think there has up to now been uh, insufficient prior communication um, uh, from all quarters. And unfortunately, these aspirant young graduates are now going to arrive at the doorstep of industry and apply for um, opportunities for employment. You know, this has been a 10, 15 year process and the horses bolted. So, you know, we, we can't dwell on trying to close the stable door. Um, we need to look at that. So what are the realities in industry? You do have uh, a lot more knowledge and understanding of what a four year BSc engineering graduate has to offer. What are their limitations? Although I would add uh, that, you know, these days, um, um, many even four year engineering graduates facing a similar challenge simply because industry cannot absorb all of those students in the institutions for vacation work, which used to be the uh, mandatory practice in the past. And those who are fortunate enough to have secured bursaries are likely to have that opportunity with companies who might be their bursaries. But anyone else who's funded from any other sources um, could be from their family. I mean, um, from the, you know, uh, may have difficulty. So we sit with this invidious situation that industry now has to now consider how do we absorb both four-year BSc graduate and the three-year, neither of whom have any level of prior work exposure, and I'm talking in the main. Um, and and I may be able to actually offer them the same entry level salaries. I mean, this, these are just realities. Now, if we take the fact that um, both have no real work exposure in, in specific to, you know, uh, how consulting engineering companies work and, and uh, many in discussions with many of them would love to absorb many more. But unfortunately, um, the Pandora's box around and the Competition Commission, unfortunately, 
continues to misunderstand the need for the publication of a fee guideline that helps to guide what should be a minimum fee that engineers would charge as in their consulting capacity. And so you have this downward spiral on fee incomes and discount on for these professional fees and still expecting the same services. But at the same time, companies then end up because their margins, profit margins are slim. Um, they have to limit their investment in overheads and entry level employment. Um, about three years ago, I, I spoke to one of our um, member companies, a senior person, and their assertion was the setup costs for somebody that they take on is no less than about 70,000 Rand upfront um, and and that's for workstation um, and and every other bit of equipment and access that they would have to afford such a person so they do take on a few but probably not enough because they can't afford to and and that's because of the uh, the shrinking uh, um, fee basis in fact, if you look at uh, our figures, uh, employment figures in, in consulting over the last uh, six years, uh, it's gone down significantly, um, you know, so that's quite a large amount of people to um, to have been lost from the industry. But that's a factor of the economic activity, the investment in the country uh, on what we call gross fixed capital formation. And if if we if we have a look at this particular slide, which is uh, its most recent indicator uh, of uh, consulting engineering fee earnings as a percentage of um, let's say of construction uh, of the construction uh, costs, for example, would be the blue lines, the blue bars, vertical bars, but red off the left axis. And so that's roughly, I'd say about two point, less than 2.5%. And then if we look at that same figure and, and, and bear in mind, if you look at the irregularity of the bars, you will see that from June, from 1997, the horribly cyclic nature uh, that we see is as a direct bearing on, on the um, uh, income earning potential of companies and their ability then to absorb um, every uh, graduate. And then likewise, if you look on the right axis, the percentage of fee earnings uh, as a percentage of GDP over time also has uh, fluctuated dramatically. Uh, you know, we're in about, let's go to our glory years, say about 2008, was sitting at uh, nearly heading towards 0.6%. And uh, present day, we are uh, below 0.2%. So I think the, 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 you know, financial context matters. And, and, you know, it unfortunately is something that has affected the uh, ability to absorb these uh, many graduates. What course of action do we as professionals, practitioners uh, and, and everyone in, in our areas of influences? Firstly, we need to encourage our decision makers to get firstly the construction industry recovery plan on track. Um, and then even more importantly, because the construction uh, of infrastructure has been identified as a key catalyst for our economic recovery plan, one being a factor of the other, we need we need these to happen rather quickly. And uh, of course, uh, you know, I'm not going to dwell on uh, the uh, current situation regarding the Sandrails um, cancellation of uh, significant projects. Um, it's really, I think that uh, somehow maybe somebody was facing in the wrong direction um, uh, of, of the goalposts 
and uh, certainly this could be a, a significant setback. The next bit of essential ingredients to getting us back on track is the investment certainty. Um, you know, in the private sector, there's there have already been responses to the president's various uh, investment forums, investment uh, um, conferences and so forth, but nowhere near uh, what could be. And, and it has to do with the policy and political and, uh, certainty that's required because the money from the private sector it's not one person's money. Those are people's pensions. So there's a level of responsibility that goes along with that. We need to start more vociferously marketing, marketing the offering of your BNC tech to industry so that it's not a strange anomaly for this young graduate to appear on my doorstep and be applying for a position. And I now need to make a decision. But uh, on on you know, is there do how many how many four year uh, graduates do I have because I'm looking long term? How many do I need immediately? So there's there's that family I need to build. But importantly, also we need to consider that, and and this is where we've we've sort of got it wrong in our societies. There's not a competition between who's better and who's worse. I think we need to acknowledge that the basis is different, the depth is different. Uh, and, and I would argue that even in the four year engineering degree, the academ academia, they struggle to cover all of what needs to be covered. And there's a whole lot more that those students need to do for themselves. Um, and, and, and so one then would wonder you know, how much greater would that challenge not have been in that three year uh, process? And then managing the expectation of these Bachelor of Engineering Technology graduates, because they are going to be on your doorstep. They're going to call themselves engineering graduates and they are engineering graduates. And, and they are going to have certain expectations. Uh, one to uh, not unlike some of our four year PSC graduates want to um, fly, uh, fly before they can even crawl, much like young children. We've got to first learn to crawl properly, then we walk, then we run and then we fly. As graduates, and I was there as well, we immediately walk out of the halls of learning and we want to walk on water or we want to fly. So we need to manage those expectations. Uh, and I'm, I maybe sound a bit flippant, but it is what it is. I think we have that situation now. And I do believe that our young people, our future generation should not be the victims to unintended consequence of attempts to solve what was the original problem. The original problem was the absolute cyclic nature of the rollout of infrastructure uh, over the last, um, you know, however many years, uh, let's say, over 20, 25, nearly 30 years. And also, which one hopes a lesson will be taken from our GFIP, uh, ETOLs still not resolved. Consultation has to be thorough, um, you know. And then how do we solve this for future and avoid such own goals is that there must be a much stronger collaboration between industry and academia. Uh, it has unfortunately, in my opinion, has eroded somewhat over several years. We need to get back to how do we just collaborate. And, and it's not industry then trying to dictate to academia that uh, people should be able to do. I think it's important that you get taught how to think first. And then uh, in that process, if, if, if some of the to do aspects can be imparted, that certainly helps. If we, in moving forward, see that we have not quite solved this problem and this uh, situation lingers, we shouldn't wait another 10, 15 years, um, you know, to address the the, the problem. We sh the the correct problem. We should then proactively 
uh, act to to avoid a repeat of the same. And um, it might be because, you know, I most engineering practitioners, we retire eventually. And if we look at the age profile of many, um, you get to the retired and active. I'm not yet at the retirement age. And hopefully, um, should there become a need for this rethink and so on, that hopefully there's sufficient institutional memory that we uh, would have preserved to inform this decision making uh, in the future. Because I think, unfortunately, we, we do have a habit of, of losing that. With that, colleagues, I'd like to thank you uh, for listening.